to our opening session of uh, our Thursday events for Ethics Awareness Week. My name is Brian Birch. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Ethics here at UVU. And we've had a very interesting week of discussions around our theme of ethics, education, and democracy. And we've had sessions from each of our colleges and schools on campus, along with sessions uh, done in partnership with other centers on campus. And we want to thank all the all of our partners and friends. I want to thank the staff of the Ethics Center uh, and our uh, friends on the Faculty Advisory Board and everyone who made this possible. So this morning's discussion is in, or this morning's session is intended to be a conversation. So I hope you students are ready to uh, share your thoughts on, on the issues at hand, uh, which I think are important. Uh, and I hope that you see how important they are to your education uh, here at UVU. So the session is entitled uh, Viewpoint Diversity on University Campuses. And the way, it'll will, uh, the way it'll work is that I'm gonna show you a couple of videos just to help orient you to the concept of viewpoint diversity, how it's talked about, uh, and then I'm just gonna say a couple of words uh, to help uh, cultivate discussion. And then I've actually asked a handful of people here in the audience if they can share their perspective on this issue from their position here on campus. And then obviously we wanna hear from you students. That is uh, a key objective. So with that in mind, let me just go ahead and play these. What is reason? Philosophers have long told us it is humanity's highest and noblest attribute. It's what separates us from other animals. It's what allows us to separate truth from falsehood. There's just one problem. When psychologists study real people trying to reason, what they find is that reason has a gigantic, crippling flaw. It's called the confirmation bias. People don't use their reasoning abilities to find the truth. They use reason to confirm the views that they already hold. Now put people into teams where everyone holds the same beliefs, and the confirmation bias grows into a collective mania. Everyone helps everyone else find reasons why their side is right, further deepening shared bonds. Heaven help any individual who thinks for herself or who looks for evidence on the other side. Such people are called traitors, and groups have many ways of shutting them up. When everyone's beliefs line up and when dissenters are punished, that's the definition of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy can be great if you're heading into battle and you want everyone marching in lockstep, but what if your goal is truth rather than victory? What if you actually wanted to help students overcome their confirmation bias and learn about the perspectives of others? What if you wanted to create a community of researchers who could actually study and solve social problems? In other words, what if you wanted to create a university? Would you want orthodoxy? Or would you want its opposite, heterodoxy, where multiple views are not just permitted, but encouraged? In a heterodox university, each person can still use their reasoning powers to find reasons why they are right and others are wrong. But here's the brilliant thing. Each person becomes the solution to someone else's confirmation bias. This is why universities must have viewpoint diversity. Viewpoint diversity is the only reliable way to get around confirmation bias. Viewpoint diversity is the secret to a great education. It may not always be comfortable, but when ideas collide, we learn, we grow together. Everyone gets smarter. The alternative? Campuses that try to protect students from unapproved ideas, books, and speakers. A politically orthodox university discourages dissent, creativity, empathy, and truthfulness. That's why more than a thousand academics from across the political spectrum have joined Heterodox Academy. Working with students, professors, and administrators, Heterodox Academy is rebuilding the culture of free inquiry and open, civil debate that turns universities into engines of discovery, growth, and progress. Support free inquiry. Share your voice. Stand up for viewpoint diversity. Visit heterodoxacademy.org.
We hear so much talk, rightly, about diversity, especially on college campuses. There are diversity days regularly, and there are diversity deans. But unfortunately, that notion of diversity is only extending to personal characteristics, which are very important, but we really haven't had a parallel commitment to ideological diversity, diversity of perspective, diversity of thought, diversity of philosophy, so that we can uh, nurture the most robust exchange of ideas. One of the things that I think is important at universities is to follow a principle which says anyone who's qualified and prepared to put their own minds at risk is welcome here. You're encountering people who are challenging your convictions. Um, that to me is what diversity is about. Whatever students have been uh, taught or, or however they've been socialized in high school, there's a big transition point in their first months in college. And students are thinking, well, how should I be? What's the right way to be here? What do students at this university do? And if we expose them to programming and reading about the importance of viewpoint diversity, about the frailties of human cognition, about confirmation bias, if we expose them to the wisdom of so many past generations about the need for moral humility, the need to give others the benefit of the doubt, we can put them in a mindset where they can actually not just tolerate real diversity, but actually welcome interacting with people who are different from them. I uh, was asked here at Brown to give the speech that a faculty member gives every September to the incoming class of new students at Brown University. My title was Identity and Authenticity. We should be seeking to transcend our categories. I summarize my address in so many words. We ought to leave here differently than what we came. Um, we ought to be interrogating and questioning, uh, not seeking to have a reaffirmation and a, a comfort in the thing that we, uh, that we bring in here. If you're going to coexist in a world in which there really is diversity, developing the frameworks, virtues that make it possible for that type of understanding, it does seem to me is an important contribution to the academy. Excuse me. I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some of the concepts associated with viewpoint uh, diversity just to kind of help uh, fertilize our conversation uh, this morning. So oftentimes universities are seen as a marketplace of ideas. That is a metaphor that is often used uh, by people regardless of where they sit on the ideological spectrum or the ethical or, or political spectrum, right? People are committed to the idea of a marketplace. But one question that emerges for people like me and others on this campus who have to navigate and, and create an environment of diversity, there, there are questions about what exactly does it mean? What does it mean to call a university a marketplace of ideas? And how should it be applied on this campus? Right? How, does, how should the university leadership, whether from the president's office or from deans or department chairs or program directors or center directors, right? How should we try to advance this uh, longstanding goal and, and tradition in, in higher education? And obviously there are, a lot of a f there are a lot of factors that play into this, right? Obviously freedom of speech is an important factor when trying to cultivate uh, diverse points of view. Uh, on campus, right? Campuses are often seen as the as uh, centers of free speech, uh, and and they should be cultivated as such. Uh, a second issue is academic freedom, and academic freedom and freedom of speech are not the same thing. They are related to one another, but academic freedom 
uh, extends beyond freedom of speech where uh, students and professors and other uh, citizens of the university right, are given the kind of freedom they need to explore challenging points of view and to explore points of view that are not popular. Uh, and it, it, academic freedom actually builds in protections for people who are trying to open up uh, inquiry into uh, uncomfortable areas. Obviously, there are issues related to equity and inclusion. Right? How does viewpoint diversity connect with other diversity goals of the campus? Right? Uh, whether it be ethnic diversity, racial diversity, socioeconomic diversity, religious diversity, whatever form it takes, right? how does viewpoint diversity relate to those things? And then obviously those of us who work at UVU need to keep in mind the institutional mission. What is the university trying to do? What are its goals? Because our, our activities need to align with what the university is trying to do more generally. So I thought that I would just throw out a few questions for you and, and explain what I mean by these. And then I've invited a handful of people here to, to make some comments uh, to help cultivate our conversation. So the first question is, how wide should the spectrum extend for viewpoint diversity? And that question goes to issues of where are the boundaries of viewpoint diversity? We might say that we're committed uh, to uh, points of view that disagree with our own, but where does that end, right? Uh, what about uh, somebody who uh, is expressing views on uh, th that align with neo-Nazism or eugenics, right? Or some other thing that the vast majority of, of society rejects. Should viewpoint diversity extend? How much of a voice should those, right, uh, perspectives be given? Or should they just be rejected outright? And if they're rejected outright, how do we determine which ones we listen to and which ones we don't? So that's what's connected with the first question. The second one is, what is the relationship between neutrality and viewpoint diversity? And what I'm getting at here is, as professors here at UVU and all across the country, there we actually have debates among ourselves about how much we should be neutral in the classroom. So some professors argue that the job of the professor is to be politically neutral or, or ideologically neutral and then expose students to a number of different points of view. Other professors argue that the word professor means to profess and for them, that implies that the job of teaching is to express your own point of view in the classroom. So that's been an ongoing debate here at UVU and all across the country, uh, for that matter. And then the third question is related to the second, uh, which form of viewpoint diversity is better? My, what I call micro diversity or macro diversity? Micro diversity is what I just described. Within a single classroom, the professor exposes students to different points of view, where there's a kind of neutrality there. Where macro diversity is the idea that inside the classroom, professors right, share and extend right, and dominate uh, the class with their own points of view with the expectation that students will get diversity in other classes. So if you look at their experience across the span of three or four or five years or whatever it is, that students will be exposed to different prof professors who have different points of view about a given issue. So that's macro diversity. And I'm posing the question here to you, uh, which one do you think is better? Which one do you think advances your goals as a student? Uh, and for the faculty here, which one do you subscribe to as a faculty member? And why do you believe that that's the better way? So with that in mind, I want to uh, open it up uh, to our respondents, our plants in the audience, if you will, right? 
uh, I've asked a handful of people to speak, and I want to start with Joe Vogel. So, Joe, could you just introduce yourself and give the the audience your perspective, right? Where you come at this? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm visiting here from uh, Massachusetts. I used to be a student at UVU, uh, so I was part of a panel uh, just a couple of days ago that was discussing a visit that we had here at UVU from Michael, filmmaker Michael Moore. Uh, which became like a huge uh, controversy that uh, was covered both nationally and, and, and within the state. Um, really kind of an interesting thing to revisit it because at the time I was, you know, 22 years old. I was a student. I was just trying to figure things out, trying to figure out my own views, my own political views. Uh, but I was in a position as student vice president to invite speakers, and I, uh, I thought, uh, you know, in the lead up to the 2004 election, it would be a good idea to get students thinking and talking. And Michael Moore at the time was a big figure uh, that was raising, I thought, important questions. Uh, and in response to that, there was there was a huge backlash. There was, uh, you know, bribes, threats, uh, you know, all kinds of, of crazy, crazy things. So, um, what I have learned since then uh, is that that. What I witnessed, what I experienced uh, as a student um, has probably gotten worse, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. I think that uh, campuses have become more uh, orthodox. Uh, I think that, that both students and professors are uh, walking on eggshells a lot, are kind of scared oftentimes. Of, of diversity of views. Um, and so, you know, I'm really happy that uh, uh, Dr. Birch uh, organized this because I think it's a really kind of important question for us to kind of think about uh, with, with diversity viewpoint. One, one way that I think about it, I wrote a book on uh, the author, James Baldwin, and his indictment of America was that we hate complexity. <laughs> and I think he's right. I think on the whole, we don't like complexity. Uh, we like to have our teams, right? We like to belong to a team. It's very comfortable to be part of a team. Um, and, and it's very affirming, right? When everybody, uh, you know, thinks the same things, believes the same things. But w one question that I've always thought about since that Michael Moore experience is, if you belong to a community, what happens if for any reason you diverge from the orthodox thinking of that group, right? So let's say you're a liberal, right? You're a liberal professor, you're surrounded by liberal professors. What happens if on one particular issue, you don't toe the line, right? Or if you're part of a religious community and you, you do all the things you're supposed to do, right? Uh, you believe in all the things, but maybe on one thing you disagree. What happens, right? And I think it says a lot about the group or the community, uh, the, the answer to that, right? What happens to that person? How is that person treated, right? If they happen to have, you know, one view or a couple views that diverge a little bit, uh, you know, how, how are they treated, right? And I, I think um, oftentimes we always think about this as a them issue. Well, that's a, that's a conservative issue, or that's a liberal issue, right? And there's a kind of lack of self-awareness. But I think for any group, any community, whether it's religious, political, whatever, whether it's an institution of higher education, we should be asking this question. You know, what happens to people uh, who may think differently on a particular issue? Um, so that's, I guess, would be my starting point. Just to, uh, just to add a couple things, right, the, the Michael Moore uh, controversy took place in 2004. And one of the issues that was relevant during that discu discussion, if you can call it that, uh, was the question of whether or not Michael Moore reflected the values of this community. So some of the out, this is our university, and, and this speaker does not reflect our values and therefore is unfit to present to our students, you know, and then uh, the, the advocates of this position, you know, launched, in, launched into, you know, arguments about exposing their children to evil, right? So it, it quickly turned from a question of inviting 
uh, a provocative activist filmmaker to questions of good and evil, right, and how they play themselves out at a state college at the time. Uh, very interesting. And, and Joe alluded to this, but in recent years, we've seen the same thing happen on the other side of the spectrum, right? Conservative provocateurs like Ben Shapiro, right, and others who are well known in popular culture have been invited by student groups to speak on a campus, right, and the outcry, right, similar arguments, different ideological perspective, saying, how in the world can we invite this person to speak at our university? This person doesn't reflect the values of our university. And then the question arises, to what extent should it be expected that someone who speaks on campus reflect the values of that institution? So we've got some things that are, that are really in, in tension here. And uh, Joe just made a very good point, and I just want to underscore it, that this is on, on both sides of the ideological spectrum, if you want to put it in dualistic terms, right? But it's on all sides. It's an issue that, that no matter where you come from on these issues, it's got to be dealt with and grappled with. Uh, so next up, I'd like to ask Elena Sapp uh, to speak to this issue from the perspective of a student. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna uh, try and explore ideas, kind of do the first and third question. Um, so how wide should the spectrum extend for viewpoint diversity? Um, <laughs> first, it makes me wonder where it's kind of presented in the first video you showed us as like these red and orange and yellow colors versus the blue and green colors. If there's really just uh, two whole perspectives that are represented when we try and encourage viewpoint diversity. And that my question about that is like, does that ever do anything for challenging ideas or exploring something you didn't already know because um, you know, that already limits it to a dichotomy. Um, the uh, other thing I wonder with that one is, um, to what extent should we identify with our beliefs? Because um, when we do so, it seems like we become more defensive about them, less likely to see them as something that would be uh, possible to change. Um, and then, I mean, our beliefs can be related to uh, things that we identify with, but um, the, I the ideas themselves, uh, if we if we kind of disconnect how we identify or yeah if we don't identify with our beliefs maybe we're allowed to represent more viewpoints without feeling threatened by them um, and then uh, let's see when it comes to um, which ideas should be represented it's also important to wonder if we try and make a truth claim if we have um, beliefs that are uh, kind of base on something that we can come together and decide is untrue, do we still allow to that for that to exist? Because with things like respecting religious diversity, there's definitely reasons why we might say that someone's belief or look at um, each other's beliefs and say that they're simply not founded on something that's true because um, we don't have a way to tell whether or not it's true. Um, and so does that extend to other political ideas? Um, such as conspiracy theories, for example, um, because those can be based on um, beliefs about a reality that may or may not be seen as true. So do we represent those beliefs? Um, and then at the, the last question, um, macro versus micro, um, I think I, my first ideas are about whether or not it's possible or which one is more likely to represent in. Because in the micro environment, um, I think you'd see a lot of success in encouraging individuals to think thoughtfully about the things that they're discussing. Um, more likelihood that you'd have a one-on-one -on -one conversation if there's ever a, a risk of, of course, all the emotions coming up with questioning or exploring new ideas, that they'd be able to have someone support them through it. But um, with the micro or the macro one, um, you know, we can actually represent ideas in their entirety and not ask one person to try and put on different hats and, and pretend to be all these different people that, that they might not be. Um, of course, the macro um, environment can be influenced by all sorts of things, um, funding especially, and that makes it so it's um, more of a, a problem to try and represent every belief. Thank you. Just to give a little more information on Elena, Elena is a member of our Ethics Bowl team, and as part of that process, they're encouraged to think about 
how to respond to, to points of view that are different from their own and how to do that in a formal debate setting. Uh, so thank you, Elena, I appreciate that. Uh, next up, Verlin Lewis. Uh, would you mind sharing your thoughts with us and just tell us uh, where you're coming from on campus? Uh, sure thing, Because yeah. you're relatively new, most people don't know you. Yeah, happy to introduce myself. Thanks for having me, Brian. So my name is Verlin Lewis. I'm a professor um, of constitutional studies here at Utah Valley University. I've just been here a year. And you might be thinking, how does it have anything to do with what we're talking about here, about viewpoint diversity on um, higher education campuses? And I kind of had the same thought when Brian called me yesterday and asked me to participate. But I will say, I've been giving it some thought, and I do think there are actually some connections between my own scholarship on constitutional studies and what we're talking about today. And one of the first things that came to my mind as I was thinking about this um, is the problem that regimes have, political regimes have, in promoting viewpoint diversity. So I teach my students you know, the typical Aristotelian typology of regimes. You can have rule by the one, the few, or the many. And in the United States, we claim to be a democracy, rule by the many. And each kind of regime struggles with this problem of viewpoint diversity because of the things that were mentioned in the video, the problems of confirmation bias, the problem of people wanting to admit information that confirms what they already believe rather than seek the truth. And so in a regime where you have rule by the one, like a, a kingship or a dictatorship, um, there's going to be incentives for that one person to impose their views and prevent any dissenting viewpoints. You see this happening in Russia right now, right? Putin is a dictator, and he's preventing or trying to prevent information that contradicts what he's trying to put out to his people um, from coming into the country. You see this in oligarchies as well. Look at China, for example, right? There's um, regimes where the few rule, in this case, the Communist Party of China, and they don't want dissenting viewpoints to come into the country. They try and stop um, differing views coming through with social media, with uh, over the internet. We also see this problem in democracies where rule by we have rule by the many, where the many, the majority, try to stop dissenting viewpoints from proliferating. And as I think about how the creators of the U.S. Constitution dealt with this issue, I'm reminded of James Madison, right? So if we remember, hopefully many of you have read the Federalist Papers. In Federalist 10, Madison deals with this issue. He says the problem with democracies is the problem of majority tyranny. If you have a regime where the majority rules and the majority gets to win, how do we prevent that majority from being tyrannical, from imposing their views and stopping any other dissenting viewpoints. I think this connects with what Joel was saying earlier from, from Baldwin, right? That there's, there's this uh, tendency in democracies to try and shut down complexity and just have the one dominant view prevail. Well, Madison's solution was pluralism. He said we need to have a multiplicity of viewpoints. He says in a small republic, you'll only get a couple factions. And it's very easy if you only have two viewpoints for one of them to have a majority, whether that's 99 to 1 or 51 to 49. If there's only two viewpoints, by definition, you will always have a majority faction. The solution, according to Madison, was to in increase the sphere, to take in a multiplicity of factions. It would be very difficult for anyone to gain a majority. And I think that's the same for us today. And I actually um, want to completely 100% agree with Elena's question about the problem of only having two viewpoints. And I think that's what the left-right spectrum does to us. So my own scholarship, I'm publishing a book right now on the myth of left and right. I would think we would all be better off if we never talked about left and right in terms of political terms, because it's a myth. There's not just one issue in politics. We don't have a unidimensional spectrum. If we stop and think about it, of course, there's hundreds of issues in politics. It makes no sense to say that there's only one issue and everyone is either on the left or on the right. That's just a false way of viewing our politics. But unfortunately, the way we think about politics influences the way we behave in politics. And so if we think that there's only two sides and there's only one issue, then we act that way. And I'm, I've noticed that increasingly in American politics. I think um, people tend to s say, well, if I'm on this one side of the spectrum, all of my issues are bound together by some coherent, enduring philosophy, and I'm right about everything. And that means that everyone on the other side of the spectrum who has, is on the other side of this one issue that binds together somehow, which again, I don't understand why someone who's pro-life also has to be 
um, you know, anti-free trade and also has to be in favor of the Iraq war. I mean, it's just foolish. There's no logical reason why these things have to go together. But we think that, okay, they're wrong about everything and I'm right about everything. And I think it promotes this kind of ideologism, this tribalism that dominates um, our, our society and our politics. So that would be my one, kind of coming from my own research, my one suggestion today is we stop talking about politics as if there is a left-right spectrum because it doesn't exist. Left and right are si simply social groups in our society. They're not bound together by enduring viewpoints. So that's just kind of my contribution. Thank you, Verlin. Last, but certainly not least, is Brian Waite. Please. So I'm a professor over in the School of Education. I'm in the department chair of secondary education and special education. What's that? Oh, oh, it moots for me, okay. And I also am the director of global, the Global Intercultural Initiative on campus. So I kind of have a, a dual role. Uh, but whenever I, I do something like this, I gotta put on my professor hat. I have to move around, I have to stand. So I love this topic. Um, I teach multicultural education. So I am constantly looking at diversity of thought and idea from an asset perspective, right? So like we have two ways we can look at difference or diversity, and that's from a deficit viewpoint or an asset-based viewpoint, right? And I think my colleagues who study the brain get a little frustrated with me when I simplify the brain, but I believe that we default, our brain's default as humans to look at difference from a deficit lens, right? So like if I see someone doing something different from me, I <laughs> default to, why do they do it like that? Don't they know it's way better and easier to do it like me? As if I have my whole life figured out and my life is perfect and I have no problems, right? But we tend to look at someone doing it different as, you know, just from that deficit lens. So we do an, a, an exercise um, with faculty here on, here on campus where we'll put up terms that represent different cultural traits. And we say, think of what would make it difficult to teach someone with these traits. Do you know how fast faculty can come up with what makes it difficult? Like, for example, if they don't speak English as a first language, they're like, oh man, I gotta think about how I would translate my stuff, whatever, right? And then if you flip it and say, now can you think of how it would benefit you from an asset lens, they'll get there, but it takes a while, right? And so it, 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 it is more difficult for our brains to think of difference from an asset lens. Let me ask y'all a question if you're brave enough to raise your hand. How many of you have had family members or friends that have, had so, have said something along the way of, oh, you're at the university, they are liberalizing the crap out of you? Okay, right? So we get that, oh man, don't listen to that university stuff. You're gonna turn into a liberal and all this kind of thing, right? By the way, you're at UVU in Orem, Utah, okay? Might be one of the more conservative universities you could attend, but our community, maybe our family and friends, they don't see it that way. They see us brain, your university is getting attacked all across the nation as brainwashing because of this idea of diversity of thought and, and, and thinking. And so when I teach multicultural education, I'm always trying to figure out how far to push the envelope, right? I've noticed in my own personal life that I tend to gravitate further away from wherever I am or live, okay? So I did my PhD in Boulder, Colorado. If you've ever been to Boulder, Colorado, it's a pretty liberal place, right? I realized after the six years I lived in Boulder that I, tend, I was more conservative than I actually am when I lived in Boulder. And since I've moved to Orem, I am way more liberal than I probably am just because I like to push the envelope, right? I like the, the diversity of thought and idea. And so I try to figure out how do I bring that into my classes and what role do I have as a professor, right? Because I know a lot of my students are coming into that space from their own family and, and social ideologies, right? And I get it, I know where it is and there's value in it, right? So I have to always balance like, so should I push that? Or is it more valuable for me to take even maybe a more extreme viewpoint that I actually have just to force that different thought, right? And 
I constantly have students coming back to me saying, like, seriously, every semester, like, thanks a lot, Dr. Wade. I just got this huge fight with my family over Sunday dinner because your stupid class. I'm like, yes, awesome, right? I like that. I like that because you're bringing that thought. It doesn't have to be right. My viewpoint's not right. Are you kidding me? It's a viewpoint, right? But we have got to get out of this extreme of right and wrong, good and bad. And we just are not there in our society. We have a really difficult time. It makes me think, and, and, and Dr. Birch knew who I was, so I'm assuming he knew that I was going to keep talking forever, but um, he still asked me to do this. Um, no, I, I won't go for too much longer, Brian. Um, there is a fantastic TED Talk by a guy named Arthur Brooks. I highly recommend it. It's called A Conservative's Plea, Let's Work Together. And what he does, he cites a study that is in the, um, let me make sure I get this right, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science on Political Motive Asymmetry. And basically that concept is people think, depending on what their political or social viewpoints are, that their perspective comes from a place of love and the other side's comes from a place of hate. So if I am a conservative, let's say Republican, then all of my so ways to fix our so social ills in my mind comes from a place of love. I love my country, I love my society, I love people and this is the best way to help them. But the inevitable corollary to that is the other side, I believe, is coming from a position of hate, right? And they're thinking the same thing about me. And what we have to realize is that and what Arthur Brooks argues is that it is the diversity of ideas that actually makes our society better. Like we need political conservatives just as much as we need political liberals. We need each other in order to have a more successful society. There is, this is my last thing I promise, there, there is research upon research of how diversity increases productivity. If you would like to know that research, come and hit me up and I'll share it with you, right? But we know that when we have an increased diversity of thought and culture and language and whatever, productivity in industries and businesses and even the academy goes up. So when I serve on search committees, I serve on a lot of search committees here at UVU where we hire faculty or staff. And one of the things that I hate to hear, but I hear it all the time, is, is this person going to be a good fit? Have you ever heard this? Is this person going to be a good fit? And so I always push back on that. What do we mean by good fit? The problem is we usually mean, is this person going to come in here and think like us and not really stir the pot and we'll be able to get along with them and things will be able to go status quo? But we know from research that that is, does not increase productivity. So what we, we need to get in our mind is maybe a good fit means diversity, right? And bringing in people who think differently and do things differently from us, that will make us better. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, students, you've been uh, exposed to a lot of different concepts. Uh, We've chummed the water uh, quite a bit for you in order to think about these issues and these ideas. Uh, you have people in this room, including myself, who think constantly about questions of how to expose students to different ideas. And so now is your opportunity to talk to us, to express yourselves, to share your experiences in the classroom without using any names, right? Or, you know, that would be probably be the most appropriate thing. But we'd like you to share your thoughts, your ideas, how we at the university can work better for you. And how these concepts apply to you. You know, do you think about your education as, okay, you take a philosophy class. I teach philosophy, I teach ethics and values for example, right? Is the expectation that you'll take a philosophy class from a liberal professor in your sophomore year and that that'll be balanced out if you're a business major by taking an e uh, economics class, right? Where the orientation is more conservative, 
right? Or do you expect to walk into your ethics and values class having the instructor expose you to both uh, points of view there or to be neutral between points of view? My own approach is to be aggressively neutral. That's the term I use. So that uh, along the lines of, of what Brian does, I'm constantly playing the devil's advocate. And I tell the students at the start of the semester, uh, I'm not going to share my own perspective on these issues with you. You may be able to ferret out what I think, but my commitment, the principle I'm committed to, is trying to expose you wherever you sit on, this, on the ideological array, and I like to use that metaphor better, the array, back to Verlin's point, right? Uh, to, to, to a different way of thinking. I, th I see that as inherent to my job, but I have faculty who I love and respect who think completely different, and we've had arguments for many years about this question. So it hasn't been settled, and depending on what professor you get here, you're, you're going to get one or the other, uh, and that's just part of the, that might be what is part of the marketplace of ideas. Okay, so with that said, do others want to share? You've got other faculty in here. Scott Paul, are you interested in sharing? Please, yeah, Scott back there by Verlin. Oh, will you let Scott weigh in first and then we'll, Scott, Scott raise your hand there, thank you. you want me to introduce weigh in in whatever form you would like to. Weigh in whatever, okay. So I'm Scott Paul. I serve as the director here of the Center for Constitutional Studies. Um, my my academic background is is uh, I studied the law. Um, our our center and our mission statement uh, we say that we're nonpartisan, and that's that's kind of our elevator pitch mission statement is to increase constitutional literacy at the local, state, and national levels in a non nonpartisan manner. Uh, that's that. That um, we're, we're we're actually maniacally <laughs> committed to that, uh, uh, but it's tough because as you as as Brian mentioned, uh, Brian Waite mentioned, we're we're in Orem, Utah. We're in Orem, Utah. So if if in Orem, Utah, you hear someone say, "I'm really interested in the Constitution. I, I, I like the Constitution." What are your presumptions about that person? What, what, what do you think, oh, wh where are they coming from politically? Where are they coming from ideologically? Uh, and so, and, and, and typically, uh, if you're wondering, typically the, the presumption is, oh, that, that person's gotta be conservative, that person's gotta be Republican, that's good. And uh, so w we have to work hard uh, uh, against, against these preconceived notions. Um, by the way, uh, Justices, Brown and Sotomayor and Kagan w would would like to have a word about those preconceived notions and and uh, who the Constitution or, or study of the Constitution is for. Um, uh, wha so what we have to do, uh, a lot of what we do in the center is bring people to campus to have events like these. Uh, we have to be very deliberate about bringing uh, a diversity of voices and viewpoints to campus to make sure that that when we're discussing constitutional issue. Uh, we've we've got strong advocates. Uh, our our former director said all he wants is a pl level playing field. Bring a level playing field and the best advocates to the various positions and let them talk and then trust you as students to use your brains to figure out things for yourselves uh, rather than try to coerce you towards one perspective or another. Um, I, and also, just, just a, a quick word about the law. Um, I don't know if it's, if you say the law, what, what's the symbol of the law? What are the common symbols of the law that, that you see? Um, maybe nothing comes to mind. Hopefully, what might come to mind is scales or, or justice blindfolded, um, uh, the, uh, the, the representation of justice blindfolded, sometimes blindfolded justice with scales, uh, as is the case of the Supreme Court. Uh, and this is it's the idea that there's balance. Uh, that's why you have a plaintiff and a defendant. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I learned in studying the law is uh, it, it's a great place to, to, to appreciate diverse viewpoints. 
because uh, as you're trained as an attorney, you're trained to know the opposing side's case better than they do. You have to make their argument better than they can in order to defeat their argument. Uh, and, and taking that approach, not just to prepping for a case or studying the law, but to anything, is an incredible, uh, it's, it's just an incredible system and, and approach to, to try to understand the other side, or and, and the other side, it makes it seem like it's binary and it's not. Trying to try to other side, try to understand other sides uh, better than you understand your own side. And a funny thing happens when you do that. Uh, you end up developing a little bit of empathy. Um, and when you, when you observe legal debates, even, even in settings like this as opposed to the courtroom, they tend to be incredibly civil relative to debates, uh, such hotly contested debates elsewhere. Uh, and some of that has to do with the judge who will hold you in contempt if you get out of line. But some of that also has to do with the fact that you've come to understand your opponent, uh, tried to, at least good attorneys, as well as you understand yourself. Uh, and it develops that little bit of empathy, which seems to translate into more civility than we typically see. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So with that said, thank you for waiting. Appreciate that. A yeah. Yep, go here. Hi, I'm Ricky. Um, I also am on the Ethics Bowl team. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've been looking at these three questions, contemplating what they are and kind of the views of them as everybody's been speaking. And I'm wondering why it has to be one or the other on these questions. I'm wondering why we have to choose macro or micro, which one's better, or why neutra uh, neutrality versus diversity is going to be something. Because I think... In my opinion, it would be better to go down and create different policies that help the staff that in turn help the students process this information. And we use terms uh, from like philosophy of care. We use terms from beneficence and non-maleficence in order to create a respect for everybody to teach these. So m I guess my question is why does it have to be one or the other? Is there a reason behind that or is that just the viewpoints of these questions for now? Well, it's just a way of starting the conversation. Obviously, there are different ways of dealing with the with the binaries. You know, the macro, micro. That there can be a blended uh, approach to these things. Uh, so, so the intent was just to expose students to different ways of thinking, two different ways of thinking uh, that have a different kind of value behind them and then you know to proceed from there. So no, I don't assume that there has it has to be one or the other or, th uh, or that you're either in one or the other. Uh, it's just a way of talking about it uh, as a conversation starter. That was my, my intent in presenting it. Other thoughts or comments? Here we are students, and I, I'll bet you have, you have a point of view about this. Right? I'll, I'll bet most of you do have a point of view. So hopefully, you'll be able to speak it, right? We want to hear it. Go ahead. So as a student, um, we kind of get indungeated with like uh, people telling us what their viewpoints are. And so to me, um, viewpoint diversity is to have just teachers, even if it's a different viewpoint, um, always telling me like, just it's good because it's diversity. But I was wondering if there were places for students on campus to express their own viewpoint or have like the silent middle, um, have give them a voice on campus. Yes, well, that's, that's an interesting question and others are better equipped here to, to speak to that than me. But you know, my sense of things is that the ability for students to mobilize together al along shared values or ideas uh, is, is supported and welcomed here. A and that takes the form of student clubs and associations and, and other activities uh, on campus. So I think that that, my sense of things here at UVU is that that is encouraged and welcomed. Uh, are students' voice uh, part of the conversation enough? And do they have uh, as much value as they should have here? No, I think that there's a ways we can go in terms of, of absorbing and listening to students and finding ways 
to be responsive to what students are thinking and what they want, which is part of what this whole session is for. It's one contribution to that, to that effort. Um, but it can also take uh, other forms, you know, where y if you have individual faculty members or programs or areas uh, that want to pursue these things, uh, that's encouraged as well. So nothing is, nothing discourages students uh, from mobilizing and assembling and seeking support from the university. Uh, uh, it's just a question of, you know, where it is, who's, who's doing it on the academic side of things especially, uh, and how we can advance more of that. Thank you. I do think it would be kind of interesting going forward. Um, there's obviously been a huge push. Um, w I think when we think of diversity, the first thing we tend to think of is identity, right? And, um, and so we have a lot of groups on campus that are based around identity, right? Um, and I think there's value to that. Uh, but it's also the case that people within an identity group also have diverse views, right? Um, and so it would be kind of an interesting movement, I guess, in higher education if we start to see, you know, to your point, uh, you know, more student groups focused uh, on, you know, uh, views and ideas and, um, and, and maybe things that, that uh, cross some of these arbitrary lines. Um, you know, it may be the case that somebody that comes from a completely, this was my experience, uh, you know, not only as a student, but in life, uh, that, that you meet people that, that are from different identity groups and you have a lot in common, <laughs> right? Uh, you have similar views about a lot of things uh, and, and you can become really good friends. Uh, and I think, you know, again, there is absolutely value um, and, and sometimes a necessity uh, for, for these kind of collective identity groups, but I think there's also um, the risk or, or the, the concern of, of, you know, not allowing differences to exist, right? And, and not allowing people from different backgrounds to, to kind of come together and, and find, that, find that common ground. I think that would be really valuable, especially, you know, if, if you have, uh, in spite of, of, you know, maybe uh, some differences, you have a lot in common as well. Thank you. Other comments, thoughts? But um, yeah, so more along the lines of identity, um, because I wonder what about viewpoint diversity um, actually makes us challenge our confirmation biases. I don't know if there's something inherent about that, because I wonder if we have too much of our beliefs um, as an identity, or we see ourselves as part of an identity a group that's come together over beliefs, that seeing other perspectives just puts us more in the mindset of being part of a group. and. Um, I think there's something about this with, again, like conspiracy theories, and when you see um, resistance to your ideas, you're more likely to um, kind of back into your perspective because you see yourself as being like attacked and there's a defensiveness to it. So um, even though the identity will exist as a social construct, I wonder if we can each, like in, in our efforts to combat our biases, think le less about it as a, an identity and um, um, and then let it be something that can fluctuate and change and exist in as much diversity as there is like human people. Um, and that each of those have personality differences just like we all don't fit into um, categories on the, uh, yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think a common theme here, right, is the danger of making presumptions about somebody's viewpoint, right, whether it's a political viewpoint, whether it's a, uh, ethnic identity or religious identity, uh, that there is, that that's a, that's a challenging thing and it leads to uh, further misunderstanding and reinforcing uh, divisiveness when uh, people assume that because a person has a certain kind of identity that they must accept everything they associate with that identity. And that's one thing that a university education is supposed to challenge, uh, in in at least as far as I'm concerned. 
Another thing that is, is relevant here, and it's tied to confirmation bias, is the idea that the way we consume information now is becoming increasingly compartmentalized so that a person can be exposed to media and be uh, exposed to social groups where there is almost uh, no diversity of viewpoint. So a person can essentially create their own reality in terms of who they associate with, what media they consume, uh, and uh, many, many studies confirm the fact that, that it just keeps becoming stronger and more reinforced, right? The way I see it is that universities are meant to be a counterforce to that phenomenon. Because if you're not being exposed to points of view in the way you consume media now, given all of the technology that's out there, where people are making decisions and algorithms are making decisions for you before you even look at material, uh, who's going to challenge that on either side or on all sides? Uh, that's something that I think we need to collectively think about very hard here. Yeah, I wanted to ask the students here if they've experienced while they've been at UVU a viewpoint change. Have you experienced the change in your own viewpoints? And if so, what led to that? And what opened you up to this different uh, perspective? <coughs> Any student want to, I'm really curious about your own viewpoint development here, Richard. A, a big viewpoint change of mine, it, it honestly came, so I'm a biology major. I focus a lot of a on analytics and science, and I like to focus on that. But then I had this really nerdy professor teach me ethics, and it kind of opened my eyes to it. And it kind of... Was his name Jeff? It was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you should see his shoes he usually wears, you know? Yeah, those are socks. <laughs> no, he, he kind of opened my eyes to philosophy, and it kind of made me start questioning a lot of things and be less analytical of, like, maybe not everything's answerable with science and numbers. Maybe it's something that is something we feel or something that we have to ask ourselves over and over. And even if the numbers point one way, maybe those numbers are incorrect. Maybe there's a better choice. And y the big viewpoint change that I had from that was I'm still getting a degree in biology, but now I'm also minoring in ethics. And that was a major change for me because now my viewpoints have opened up and I feel it's more broader. I've also been more open to other people's opinions uh, when they talk to me. So I wouldn't say I've been very political in my life, but I am somebody who kind of sticks by my own morals. And now when other people are speaking to me, I'm able to open myself up to what they're seeing. And even if I disagree with it, I do respect it a lot more now. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Think, please. Um, I just wanted to say, like, if we're talking about viewpoint diversity and that's the vehicle, um, I would say that the gasoline would be the Socratic method, right? Socratic dialogues. I think those are very important. We were talking about the Constitution earlier. Those things largely, in, in my understanding, um, came from things like the Socratic dialogue, right? And I think we have less of those dialogues today. I look at my own family, for example, and we have diverse perspectives, and it's gotten to the point where we just decide it's better not to talk about it, right? And I think that perpetuates the problem. And from a professor's perspective, um, finding ways to incentivize more seminar-based learning environments is hard, right? I imagine that would be hard. And, and providing points for participation may be especially hard given, you know, the rise in anxiety disorders and things like that. But I think that that may be part of the cause of the problem, right? And that it perpetuates it when we um, are less apt to engage in discussions with diverse viewpoints because that really opens the doors. And in my experience, my seminar-based classes have been the most enjoyable and have also been the ones in which I've learned the most and changed my perspectives the most to kind of answer that question as well. Yeah, appreciate that. One thing that came to mind when, when you were talking is, is the idea that engaging in a conversation with someone with whom you disagree uh, and doing it effectively is a skill. 
and it's something that can be developed as a skill. And it does take practice, right? The patience to be able to listen to somebody is among the hardest things. Right? Just, just being able to understand what they're saying, back to Scott's point about understanding the other point of view as, as well as possible so that you can challenge it or, demo or show how it's deficient, that requires listening, right? The way you respond to somebody effectively is a skill. And uh, these are the kinds of skills that, that you will learn uh, in various classes, uh, not just you know, in university, but in, in various other settings. But there are opportunities here, whether it's in the communication department, right? whether it's in the ethics bowl uh, set of activities. Uh, there are a number of ways for students to be able to develop the skill of engaging in a productive conversation which, uh, as you pointed out, right, is uh, less frequent, uh, I think, now. I think more people are resigned to not talking about these challenging ideological and political and religious issues in some cases uh, uh, because you just don't think that you can have a productive conversation with a friend or a family member or a classmate. Can I just add something to that, Brian? Yeah, so I, I really liked um, the comment here, um, not your name, but the Austin, thank you, Austin, um, about the importance of being able to share ideas in the classroom. I, I think that's so vital. And I do worry about, because there is survey data that I've seen showing that students are increasingly hesitant to share their ideas or their views in the classroom. And I, there's probably a variety of reasons for that. I, you know, I, I worry about monocausal explanations, but I, assume social media is part of that, that it's not just in the classroom, that people can be mean to each other and say negative things, but it's outside the classroom, these things can carry with you. But I think another one of them is probably this problem that we have of making our political and social viewpoints an identity. And I think that's increased a lot in recent decades in American society. Because we have two ideological tribes, Team Red and Team Blue, and that's how we think about politics and that's how we divide people up. If someone makes an argument for a particular position on a particular issue, we are so quick to assume so many other things about that person. Oh, you must be a part of this, you must be a conservative or you must be a liberal because you said this thing. And all of a sudden we either say, yeah, they're part of our tribe or no, I don't wanna hear anything else um, from them. And I find that myself, I don't identify with Team Red or Team Blue, but whoever I'm talking to, if they identify as a liberal, they think I'm a conservative. And if they identify as a conservative, they think I'm a liberal because I will say, you know, because I have a, a diversity of views with, within my head that don't line up on a unidimensional spectrum. And they assume things about me simply because, well, you think Trump was a bad president, therefore you must agree with all these other things that Team Blue thinks. And I'm like, no, actually, I don't agree with everything else uh, within this group. And so I think if we can um, disengage our identities from our political views, we'd be more willing to share. Because if, you, if, if your political views are a social identity, then if someone criticizes one of your views, it's like a personal attack. It's like, well, that's my tribe. That's my group. I, I have to defend them. And I think, you know, maybe to Joel's point earlier, I wasn't living in Utah in 2004, so I don't know what was going on. But I assume that Michael Moore was probably talking about the Iraq War. And, uh, you know, if there's probably a lot of people in Utah County that identifies Republican, and they were probably in favor of the Iraq War. But instead of saying, well, here's someone who's gonna make an argument against why the Iraq War is a bad idea, let's hear him out. But instead, it's this social identity thing where it's like, oh, he's criticizing the Iraq War, he's criticizing my core identity, it's a personal attack. We can't even allow this dissenting viewpoint to come in. I think that's part of the problem. Uh, and we see that so much of that, I think, on college campuses right now, unfortunately. Thank you, Verlin. If you're interested in watching the documentary film associated with the visit of Michael Moore to, to UVU, it was then UVSC, Utah Valley State College, and if you want to see Joe Vogel, right, in a younger incarnation, the, the film is uh, titled This Divided State. And it, it's a film by Stephen Greenstreet who did a fabulous job telling the story and really trying to absorb the different perspectives 
uh, that were present on this campus. And just to give you a sense for how uh, vibrant the discussion was, the Michael Moore controversy at UVU was, I believe, the fourth most covered story in the state of Utah I in the year it took place, you know, which tells you something. It gained national media attention as just one manifestation of the culture wars. But I see it through the lens. I was here for it, and I, I watched it and experienced it and participated in it through the lens of the evolution of this university. You know, what does it mean to, for a university to grow up and develop and mature and, uh, and, and really be committed uh, to diversity? That's what I think is one t important takeaway here. Um, so I wanted to make a comment about the, the uh, just not having the conversation anymore. Because I, th I, so I teach teachers, right? People who are going to be teachers. And one of the things that comes up a lot is, well, I don't want to talk about that particular issue because I don't want to get fired, right? Like my students say that all the time. And um, so what we do is, be, and, and also we're like really in a sensitive spot in our society right now where people we get offended and then we don't know what to say we don't want to offend someone so we just avoid it like no one wants to talk about race and racism right because you're like well I don't want to I, I just don't want to go there and so I don't want to talk about it and so there's this there's this paradigm thinking that if we don't talk about it then racism won't exist right if we just don't talk about racism well that's not true um, but so I, I would really encourage you all to to be willing to have the difficult conversations um, even though they're uncomfortable and we, we don't know always how to do it, it, they are important, right? So one of the things that, and, and, I'll, and I'll just share this, I take my students through a very deep self-cultural awareness activity because I am a firm believer that we cannot understand and value someone who is different unless we first understand ourselves. Because what happens if we don't understand ourselves and where we're coming from and why we have certain perspectives, then we just think whatever we think is right and good. But when we do a deep dive into who we are and why we even have those perspectives in the first place, we start to realize, wait a minute, that's not right. It's just a way of thinking. And it's way easier for me then to look at someone who's different as just being different. And then I can have those more difficult conversations because I don't have to get stuck on right and wrong, good and bad. I can just be okay with difference. And that's where I just think we have a huge breakdown in our society right now and we've got to fix. Craig, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Many of these students are, are yours in your Ethics and Values classroom. Yeah, so I'm not sure what to add. I don't have um, a lot of thoughts on these issues. When you brought up these questions, I was asking kind of the same questions I think that Richard was asking. What about the dichotomy of these? Um, and I was thinking about my own approach in the classroom. Um, I'm rather neutral as well, but I do think if the students pay attention, they'll discover that I'm making a point in my class that has a single trajectory. If they're paying attention, they can figure out what I'm trying to say. Um, but there's also certain, um, so I'm teaching moral theories and there's certain moral theories that I find morally repulsive. And I think that does come out in, in my teaching. So for instance, um, although I try to be neutral, um, I'm pretty harsh on relativism. Um, I just don't like relativism and I think they'll see that pretty clearly. Um, so I don't, I guess my, and I want my, my students to challenge me too. I try to encourage that. So if we can have uh, professors open to, to being challenged and encourage their students to say, push back on me, that's what makes my class fun, um, is you pushing back on me and I take your approach as well. I'll push back on, on you. Um, so I'm, I'm all in favor of Austin's having Socratic dialogue discussion and, and pushing back on each other and getting used to pushing uh, people and, and not being offended um, by that. So, Thank you, that's super valuable. Just to, uh, in closing, 
If you are interested in, in reading and ab absorbing more information about this, if you go to the schedule for Ethics Awareness Week, uh, if you scroll down below the schedule, we actually have an area set aside with some links that have readings and, and video links related to this issue. And for people who have raised references, right, Brian, I'm thinking about you, right? I'll ask you to, if you'll send me those links or references, I'll just put them there. Because uh, we want you, if you're interested in pursuing this, we want to give you all the resources to be able to do that. Uh, if you don't, we hope you had a productive time here. We hope you'll think about a lot of the issues we threw out. It wasn't meant to be systematic. It wasn't meant to be, right, there wasn't meant to be an answer at the end of the session. It was intended to, to help you understand some of the key concepts that we're thinking about at the university and that you really are a stakeholder in uh, being a student here. So with that said, uh, please join me in thanking our participants and have a great day.